Good morning and welcome to my Near Christian Church online. I'm Katie Moore and I'm glad that you're visiting with us today. Uh, just one announcement for you guys today. We're having our Family Fun Fest next weekend. We're going to have a huge movie screen set up, all kinds of popcorn and candy for you guys. We're also having a bags tournament, so go to our website and sign up for that. And have a great Sunday. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Whoa, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan? A son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Oh yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was slain And worthy is the King who conquered the grave And worthy is the Lamb who was slain And worthy is the King who conquered the grave And worthy is the Lamb who and worthy is the king who conquered the grave For worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy, worthy, worthy Oh, this is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your life that i would be set free whoa jesus i sing for all that you've done for me All that you've done for me I just want to remind you guys that um, 
You can always give online at givemcc.com or through the mail, which is going to be right along the bottom here of the screen. And we just want to thank you so much for your continued support and your continued giving through this time, just letting us know that you trust God and you trust in his goodness that he will provide. Let's pray right now for offering. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to give and continue our worship through the giving, we pray that you will take the money that's given and multiply it to exponentially expand your kingdom in this area and in the world where all of our missions reach. So right now we are thankful that you provide for us, that you bless us, and we recognize that all that we have is yours to begin with. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. And we're going to continue to sing this morning and proclaim how great our risen Lord and Savior is. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. In grace are you. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour it's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you Lord it's your breath in our lungs 
So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your prayer in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your prayer in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your prayer in our so we pour out our praise to you only. And great are you, Lord. So we sing great. So let's pray for communion. Heavenly Father, we are here and proclaiming these praises and bringing honor to your name because you first loved us. And it was that love that you sent down for us in the form of your son, Jesus Christ. We are thankful right now for his sacrifice on the cross but we're also thankful for his victory over that death that he died. So right now, as we prepare ourselves to take communion, we remember that his body was broken for us, which is represented in the bread that we're about to take. So if you have your communion ready, go ahead and take the bread right now. We also remember that his blood was shed for us to be our once for all atonement. So if you have your juice, water, coffee, whatever you have to represent Jesus's blood this morning, let's go ahead and take that right now. God, we're so thankful that we're able to call you Father. We are your sons and daughters, and we love you. We're thankful for your goodness. We're thankful for your faithfulness. And right now, we just praise you and lift up your name so that you may be glorified in everything we do. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray this morning. We thank you. And we love you. Amen. Hi, everybody. This is Rusty Richards, lead minister here at Minear Christian Church. And I'd like to begin this message with a question. Have you ever heard of the Fox reality tel television show, The Masked Singer? Uh, it's pretty interesting. In fact, it's entertaining. You need to check it out if you haven't seen it. It's hosted by Nick Cannon, and it's this top, top secret singing competition where these contestants face off against each other, where they're totally concealed, covered up um, under some elaborate costume like animals, like bees and ducks and bears and rabbits and all sorts of costumes and everybody in the audience and on the show, the host, the panelists, the viewers, the audience, everybody, even the contestants are left guessing who's inside of, of the, 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 the costumes. People just don't know. And they're given clues throughout the show uh, that kind of give them some ideas of who it might be. But contestants try to throw everybody off uh, during, during the, the show. And then at the end of each episode, they have this, they have a vote and they vote and eliminate out the least popular contestant. And then at that point, they take off their mask, revealing their true identity. You know, some celebrities that have been on the show so far, Donny Osmond, Peacock, he was a peacock. Wayne Brady was a fox. Jesse McCartney, a turtle. Chris Daltrey, a Rottweiler. Gladys Knight, a bee, and, and on and on. It's, it's really entertaining. You, you gotta check it out. But the reason why I'm starting the message with this talk about mass singers is because I feel like every Sunday 
churches all over the world um, kind of participate in a mass singer type of, of performance where an audience gathers and maybe you're contested on this, by the way, you didn't even know. And people come in and they, they put on these masks to where outwardly they look one way, but inwardly they're totally a different way. And, and no, I'm not talking about COVID masks here. I'm talking about how people come to church and then they leave to live as if they never even came and live in a totally different lifestyle. And when they, when they do, they deny their true identity, faking Christianity in a relationship with God. Why? To impress people and to justify uh, their sinful lifestyles. And, and so, you know, the Bible calls this hypocrisy. And hypocrisy, hypocrisy is simply defined as saying one thing and doing another. It's claiming uh, to believe a certain way and then living a different way, claiming and believing differently. The Greek word literally means one who wears a mask. It's pretending to be somebody you're not or someone you're not. In, in the Old Testament, it speaks of, of hypocrisy in terms of like uh, insincere worship, insincere worship led by uh, prom- or coming from a godless heart. And, um, and it's, it's shown in your actions, actions of injustice, uh, in, in idolatry and immorality. Isaiah wrote about this in Isaiah 29, 13. He says, the Lord says, these people come near to me, uh, near, near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human wisdom, rules they have been taught. You know, that's the Old Testament. Well, the New Testament, Jesus actually quotes the Old Testament in Matthew 15 when he's condemning religious folk who are uh, living and worshiping hypocritically. Uh, they're they're church going folk, kind of like some of us. They, they, they know the Bible, they're well versed in scriptures. Like some of us are passionate about obeying God and following God. But they created loopholes, loopholes to where they violated the, um, the spirit of the law. Uh, and so they, these people, I, I believe religious people are doing this today. They've been doing this for you know, thousands of years, are seeking the praise of man rather than the praise of God, the applause of man rather than applause of God. And, and people are looking down on other people and, and elevating themselves. And Jesus called, calls people out on that. And he's like, hey, listen, man, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Those things are more important than being perceived as better than or so-called perfect. Uh, Jesus points out that the problem is not the law, but the problem is our heart. The problem isn't just what we do, but it's how we do what we do. And so some people in churches all over the globe, maybe even today, maybe you, maybe I, uh, do more play acting uh, rather than genuine worshiping, more um, performing rather than true praising God. And that's what was happening in the Bible where people used the stage of the, the temple, the stage of the church of their day to perform for the applause of man rather than God. And so worship is a major theme in scripture. In fact, insincere worship and genuine worship, sincere and insincere worship are major themes in the book of Jeremiah. And that's what we've been studying so far. But we're gonna take a look of how in chapter seven, uh, Jeremiah specifically addresses hypocrisy uh, in the context of worship, in the house of worship. And this takes place during the reign of Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim's the second son of uh, Josiah. And he's the puppet king of Egypt that's kind of ruling over the, the area at that time. And he's an evil king, one of the evil kings of Judah. And uh, there's kind of a spiritual reversal that's happening right now. Uh, Josiah created this revival and instituted revival, but Jehoiakim being evil is kind of reversing things and and things are going backwards. And so right now, we're in this series uh, about revival, identifying marks uh, in movements of God. And I wanna remind you where we've come so you know why we're, we're gonna do what we're doing today. Uh, the first week, a couple weeks ago, we started out Jeremiah uh, by looking back on Second Chronicles 34 because uh, that's when Jeremiah was younger and Josiah was the first king Jeremiah kind of served under. And, um, and Josiah was a good king of Judah. 
he instituted revival, and from him, we've learned, we could learn a lot about revivals. And one of the things we could learn about revivals, one of the identifying traits or characteristics of revival is restored worship. And we saw this in Josiah's reign in 2 Chronicles 34 when uh, he uh, you know, destroyed all the idols and then he ordered the, um, the restoration of the temple. Uh, basically what he was doing is he was restoring the house of worship, the place of worship of his time. And so if we want to have worship in our day, we're going to have to restore worship. We're going to have to worship God genuinely. You see, Jeremiah witnessed that in Josiah's day. He witnessed true, authentic worship, revival-led worship, okay? And, and he, he writes about that in his book in Jeremiah about how far people have fallen from that. And so we could learn a great deal about revival and worship in here, and that's what we're going to do today. In chapter 7 through 10 of Jeremiah, if you would turn to chapter 7, that'd be great. From chapter 7 to 10, we see Jeremiah's sermons in the temple. There is his temple sermons. They're about worship. But specifically in chapter 7, we're going to read a 2,600-year-old sermon that Jeremiah wrote on worship at the entrance of the place of worship. And it's going to teach us a, a little bit about how we could truly, genuinely worship God to what worship really is and how to do it. Um, but this was given most likely during one of the three annual pilgrim festivals where people traveled uh, to, um, to Jerusalem and this, the city swelled by thousands of people. So Jeremiah stands at the gate and he gives this message. But before I get into it, I, I got a little disclaimer for you. I'm feeling a little, little concerned right now, even right here, uh, even though I'm kind of alone in this room other than uh, Mr. Jordan's in here with me. But um, you know, the, the reality is, is this is a very dangerous message I'm about to read and preach to you. It's dangerously offensive. It's so dangerous that Jeremiah, uh, they called for his death sentence just for giving it. Uh, you know, Stephen in Acts chapter 7, uh, he too uh, preached a similar message and was given a, a death sentence from the crowd. And so as I give this to you, I'm just going to kind of step back from the camera a little bit and I'm going to ask you to give me some grace. And I want you to imagine as I read this, this is chapter seven, starting at verse two. I want you to imagine uh, Jeremiah standing at the gates of the temple as thousands of people come in and he stands up and he boldly says, hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the foreigner and the fatherless or the widow and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you still steal? Will you murder, commit adultery, perjury, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known? And then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say we are safe, safe to do all these detestable things. Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to, to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. I just want to hit pause just real quick uh, on this sermon that Jeremiah is giving. Can you guys hear the hypocrisy there? The people are coming to church and they're, they're singing songs of praise, they're praying, they're giving offering, they're doing all these things, but yet they're, they're living lives contrary to their beliefs. Um, you know, this is called religion without relationship. That they were very religious people, but yet they really didn't know God intimately, personally. They didn't have a personal relationship with God. You know, chapter 12, verse 2 of Jeremiah, uh, he writes, the Lord says, they always have God on their lips, but far from their hearts. Always have God on their lips, but far from their hearts. You see, the problem with these people is it wasn't just uh, hypocrisy. It, I mean, it wasn't just idolatry, 
but it was also syncretism. Syncretism tism, is when you worship God, but you also worship other false gods. So they were not just hypocritical in the fact that their hearts weren't genuine. They were not just hypocritical because they were uh, worshiping false gods, but they were also hypocritical because they were worshiping false gods and Yahweh. And so they were hip hypocritical in three ways. Um, their, their actions uh, didn't match up to their beliefs and, and their claims. They, they would believe and worship the God of justice, but at the same time, they would act unjustly. You know, we speak of justice and, and injustice as getting justice done, getting justice um, you got to get justice. But the Bible speaks of justice as doing justice. Biblical justice is practicing uh, right behavior in all our relationships. I got that from the Cornerstone Biblical Commentary, which is an awesome resource if anybody's looking for a good commentary. Some good stuff in there. But these people were worshiping a just God and acting unjustly. They had lost respect for the house of worship and God's presence in the house. In verse 10 and 11, he, the, it says, the Lord says, this house, speaking of the temple, which bears my name. He says it actually two times. This house which bears my name. Basically, there's a connection in the Bible that connects the name of God and the presence of God. That, that they're, they're, they're synonymous, they're, they're together. God is saying, have you forgotten whose house this is? Have you forgotten where I dwell? Do you not have any respect for, for me in my presence? Do you, do you not realize what makes this temple so great? How dare you do this in my presence? The people have lost their respect for God. Now, I want you to take a look at verse nine, and I want you to count uh, the, how many of the 10 commandments you could find in verse nine. Now, if my count is correct, uh, you could see that the people violated or were violating at least half of the Ten Commandments. But here's the problem. The biggest problem wasn't that they were violating half of the Ten Commandments, but that they were okay with it. Twice in the text, it says that they were deceived. They deceived each other by their words. They, they, had, they were misinterpreting uh, some stuff, thinking that because they had the temple, they had security in the temple, they could go out and live however they want. And God will never leave them. God will never judge them because they have the temple. And they got this license to sin mentality from, uh, from back in uh, when Isaiah promised uh, Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, and that because of the temple, uh, that they would be safe, but that, but that no longer stands as true. And, and over and over again in the text, we see that these people had forgotten who God was, that God was holy, that God was to be respected, and God was to be feared. You know, uh, Elsie and Darwin Lequa are Amanda's, my wife's grandma and grandpa. And over the last couple of years, they both went on to be with the Lord. And they loved the Lord dearly. And Amanda loved them. And I loved them. We all did. They were just some of the sweetest, nicest people. They were also avid golfers. And they were really good at golfing. In fact, both Elsie and Darwin uh, got a hole in one at the same hole at different times. And it's a pretty cool story. But um, anyway, after they passed uh, away, uh, because I didn't have a golf set, uh, somehow I was gifted Elsie's golf club uh, set and bag. And, you know, I didn't mind playing golf for a couple of years with a woman's bag. I mean, it, yeah, it was kind of embarrassing every now and then pulling out a pink ball uh, as I played golf, but it, I was okay with it. But not long ago, I decided to buy a new golf bag bag and golf set. And uh, so I, I spent some time taking the golf clubs out and putting the new golf clubs in and kind of cleaning out the bag. And while I was cleaning out the bag, was, you know, I found the usual stuff, golf tees, golf balls, but I also found some stuff that Elsie had left in there. Her favorite candy, these Werther's uh, cough drops, and I uh, found uh, some, some plastic hair nets and some suntan lotion, but also found this membership pass from their favorite golf course. 
uh, where they would play all the time. It's the Homewood Golf Course in Ames, Iowa. And anyway, uh, you know, these, I tell you this, and you're probably thinking, so what? Uh, what, is, what does any of these items or any of this story have anything to do with the temple and worship? Well, the truth is, is that these items may not matter to you, but to my wife, Amanda, and I, uh, they represent uh, two of the best people we've ever known, Elsie and Darwin Lekwa. And, uh, and to, to, to Amanda, they conjured up, they invoked a real heartfelt emotional response as she reflected on the people that these items represented. And, uh, and at one point, my son Owen said, Mom, uh, why, why are you so upset? What's, what's going on? And Amanda just could not keep back the tears. She got choked up as she, she told Owen that these were uh, grandma and grandpa's, Gigi, um, uh, her, her golf stuff. Now, why? Why is that? It's because they belonged to somebody she loved and respected and cared for. And so in, the, in a similar way, the temple is not just a building. It's, it's, it's a place to be respected and revered because the temple has God's name on it, his presence inside of it. And even though uh, people in that day would look at the temple, they'd, they'd mark on, remark on how beautiful it was on the outside with all of its courtyards and buildings and stuff and gates. Um, the truth is, is it wasn't on the outside that made the temple so special, but it was what was on the inside that God dwelled or chose to dwell in that spot. But the people missed that. And instead, they were putting their, their trust in the building itself. They were substituting the building for God. They were misinterpreting um, the temple in these promises. They had this, this cliche, this chant that they would give. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Again, that came from a promise Isaiah had given to Hezekiah. But Isaiah told him that, you know, uh, or Jeremiah was telling them that that no longer stands today because of their idolatry and breaking the covenants of God. That, that that would be true, but it's not true in this instance because they're living hypocritically. They're worshiping God. Mass. They don't have a heartfelt emotional response to the God that dwells inside the temple they don't respect his name. They're not trusting in him. They're trusting in themselves. Their hearts are, are not marked by true worship. Their faces are, are masked. Th instead of getting meaningful praise, what we get is we get shallow mass performance. They're not motivated by love. Instead, they're masked with pride and selfishness. And it's so interesting that during this text, you, you see all three uh, of the major covenants there. You, there's three covenants listed here. There's Abraham's covenant, there's Moses' covenant, there's David's covenant. You see Moses or Abraham's covenant when it talks about the land that was given to them by their forefathers, their ancestors. That's referencing the, the promised land of Moses' covenant. And you see... Uh, uh, um, or D Abraham's covenant. And you see Moses' covenant when it talks about the Ten Commandments. And then you see David's covenant reference when it mentions the Lord's temple, which was Solomon's temple, actually. And, and what's so crazy is that these people were violating and misinterpreting all three covenants, all three promises. See, they thought that they were guaranteed the land and that they'd never be driven off that land into captivity because of Abraham's promise. And they, they thought that they would, they, they would never uh, not have God's presence because of uh, David's uh, promise or covenant that God, God would dwell there in the temple. But the truth is, is that it did matter how they lived. And those promises, those covenants were, were, were broken uh, by the people. And the truth is, is the same is true for us, that if we put our faith in this amazing, renovated building we have here on Stringtown Road, or if we put in our, our trust or our security on our movement or our denomination or a group we belong to, if, if, if we do that and we feel entitled 
to the promise that, you know, that no matter how we live, that the gates of Hades shall not prevail against us, then we are just like those people who chanted the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. We're no different than them. And God goes so far to point out in verses 12 through 15 that he's judged people and, uh, and destroyed the temple and left people before. He says, hey, remember the tabernacle back in Shiloh? Remember what happened there? Why don't you go take a look at that place? Because here we are 450 years later and it's in ruins. And he says, if my presence dwelled there at Shiloh in the tabernacle and I did that, I allowed that tabernacle to get destroyed, then why wouldn't I now with all of this idolatry and immorality and injustice, all this syncretism, all this uh, false worship, why wouldn't I now allow that to happen here to the temple today? Verses 16 through 22 kind of talks about how hopelessly lost these people were. In fact, in verse 16, it actually, God actually says, don't bother praying for these people, Jeremiah. Don't bother praying for them because your prayers won't work because they will not repent. They will not change their ways. And then the next couple of verses describe how bad these people have fallen into idolatry and singularism. Verse 18 talks about how all generations are committing idolatry together. It says the children gather wood, the fathers light the fire, the women knead the dough and makes cakes to offer the queen of heaven. Basically, entire families are, are worshiping false gods together. It mentions the queen of heaven. Queen of heaven is Ishtar, Mesopotamian goddess of love and fertility. Her symbol was the star, so they'd bake these cakes in the shape of a star. And so people were doing that together. And they had so many idols that chapter 2 and chapter 11 says, you have as many gods as towns, as many altars as streets. As many gods as towns, as many altars as streets. They're everywhere. And verse 30 It talks about how there's even idols inside of the temple that 20 years after Josiah's revival, we have a biblical reference that there are idols back inside the temple that he once cleaned out during his days of revival. Verse 31, it it talks about this place called Topeth. Topeth means fireplace or a place of child sacrifice. In, in this place called Topeth, there was this fire pit where they would literally sacrifice children to this Ammonite god named Molech. And, uh, and, and it happened uh, in this area called the Valley of Hinnon, which was actually a trash dump outside the gates or, or the walls of Jerusalem. And the Greek word for that is Gehenna. And in the New Testament, it's used for the word hell. And evil kings, such as, uh, evil kings of Judah, such as Ahaz and Manasseh, actually sacrificed their own sons. If you go back and read in 2 Kings 16 and 21 to this uh, God named Moloch. And Jesus actually uses this word, uh, Gehenna, to describe hell. He's, he's saying, hey, listen, I can't even describe how bad hell is, but the closest I could come to here on earth, just to give you some sort of image or idea, is this place where there's this trash dump, where it smells and it's filthy and people are sacrificing you, babies, where human flesh can, can, be, can be smelled. That's what hell is kind of like, kind of. Let's go on. In verse 18, It says, they pour out drink offerings to other gods to arouse my anger. But am I the one they are provoking, declares the Lord. Are they not rather harming themselves to their own shame? Verse 20, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My anger and my wrath will be poured out on on this place, on man and beast and trees and field and on the crops of your land. It will burn and not be quenched. Basically, he's saying, hey, listen, if you're going to pour out drink offerings to false gods, I'm going to pour out my wrath on you. And, and I love how he, he says, and it's, it's interesting, he says, are you not, when you do this, are you not harming yourself? Basically, he's saying all sin has consequences and all, all sin hurts ourselves when we sin. In fact, verse 20 goes so far to say that not only are we hurt, but all nature suffers with us. This is what's called the covenant curses or covenant consequences for breaking God's uh, commands, his, his covenant with us. 
You know, he goes on in, in this chapter uh, writing about how Moses was given the sacrificial system and that the system, the purpose of the sacrificial system was to help people turn away from sin and to obey God. Uh, but over time, people forgot why they were making the sacrifice. They were just ritually making sacrifices, but they forgot why they were doing it. And the sacrifices over time lost meaning. And so in the text, God's like, hey, listen, if you're going to worship me uh, falsely, if you're going to be a fake worshiper, if you're going to be hypocritical about it, if you're going to commit adultery, if you're going to cre- commit syn- syncretism, then why don't you just go ahead and eat the meat? You might as well just go ahead and eat the meat yourself. And then in verse 23, um, he reminds us about his covenant with us when, when he writes, oh, obey me so that I will be your God and you will be my people. You know, Bible scholars call that a covenant formula. And it's found throughout scripture, especially in books like Exodus and Deuteronomy, Leviticus, where the law is spelled out. But did you know that the covenant formula, I will be your God and you will be my people, that that phrase is found more time in the book of Jeremiah than any other book of the Bible. Now, why is that? Why is that? Well, I don't know everything, but I believe that the covenant formula is in the book of Jeremiah more than any other book because the book of Jeremiah is a book that contains mostly judgment talk, judgment language. And God, in that context, wants everybody to know that he loves us and he's committed to us. And his desire is that we would express that love back to him and be committed to him as he is committed to us. And we show that love and that commitment to God by obeying him, obeying him. You know, some people think the number one problem is that people don't understand very much about the Bible. They understand too little about the Bible. And even though I agree that people need to learn more about the Bible, because, I mean, shoot, I would love it if people would learn more about the Bible. Hopefully you're learning more about the Bible right now as I speak. But I think the number one problem is not that people don't understand there are people understand very, that people understand very little about the Bible. It's that they understand uh, too much and they obey too little. That we understand too much, but we obey too little. You know, orthodoxy is right thinking or orthopraxy is right living. And Jeremiah teaches us that we need to balance our orthodoxy and our orthopraxy, our right thinking and our right living. We need to balance it. But then we need to add to it orthocardia, which is right uh, heart or right attitude. And, and so um, what I want to do right now is I want to pray. I want to pray uh, for everybody watching this that um, today, this morning, that you would worship God, not just with your thinking, but with your, your, your doing and with your being, with your heart, with your attitude. You would worship him truly. You know, um, from time to time I hear people say, um, you know, I'm, I don't go to church or I'm not a Christian because Christians are hypocrites. You might have heard that. You might have said that before. And if that's you, I just want you to know, yes. Yes, we are hypocrites. And we're hypocrites alongside of everybody else in the world that say they're going to do one thing and then they do another thing. The truth is, is we are hypocrites. But it's our hypocrisy that points our need for a savior. We acknowledge our hypocrisy because, hey, if we were all perfect and we all were not, uh, did everything that we said we would do, then guess what? We don't need Jesus, right? But the truth is, is we're trying. Christianity is about saying, I am a hypocrite because I can't do what I say I'm going to do. I can't do it. I need Jesus. I need his power. I need his his forgiveness. I need his grace. Don't we all need that? So Christianity is acknowledging the hypocrisy in our life, saying we need Jesus, but it's also trying. We're trying to genuinely follow him. Just because we're genuinely doing that doesn't mean we don't fall short sometimes. And so I want to invite you, if you're watching this, whoever you are, I want to invite you to acknowledge that you're imperfect, 
that you need Jesus. Acknowledge your hypocrisy, that you're not able to do everything and live the way that you know God wants you to live, that you want to live. You can't be who you are, who God intended you to be without God's intervention, okay? And then I'm going to ask you to try. Try, it, try on what it means to follow Christ. Another thing that Jeremiah teaches us is that worship is not just music. That, you know, you can sing all the songs you want about God and, you know, you can worship, you know, through song all the time. But if your heart is not in it, it's all for naught. The truth is, is that when we come together to worship God or when we worship God privately, that it's all about him. And it's really only for an audience of one. Worship is right thinking. It's right doing. It's right uh, attitude. It worship is a lifestyle. It's a heartfelt response to all the love that God has given us. And so right now, if you're watching this and, uh, and you're ready to acknowledge your hypocrisy, your sin, that, that you need Jesus, if, you're, uh, if you believe that he was the son of God, he died on the cross for your sin and rose again, and you're ready to worship him, you're not perfect, but you're ready to try. You acknowledge it and you, you want to try um, then I'm going to invite you to pray with me right now. And everybody else, that this, you've followed Christ for your life. Maybe you're a religious person. You go to church, you, you give, you, you sing songs, you, you do these things, but yet you want a relationship with God or you want to renew that relationship with God. Um, then I'm going to ask you to pray with me as well. Let's pray. Lord, we ask you to have your way in our hearts and in our homes, in our lives. God, we, we just want you to have your way because God, we understand that worship is more than things we do, but it's who we are and it flows from who you are, God. That God, you give us grace and you give us mercy, you give us freedom, you give us everything we need to live this life. Uh, and, and you're more than enough, you're sufficient, God. God, we acknowledge our hypocrisy, we acknowledge our sin, we acknowledge how we fall short but we also proclaim your death and your resurrection, your mercy and your, your, your power in our life. God, help us to have the right mind and heart and the right actions or practices in our life. That God, we could uh, worship you. We could love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we could love our neighbor as ourselves. And in doing that, we could live lives of worship every day. That our life could be a song of praise. So God, I pray right now for those uh, listening to this message whose, whose hearts have been far from you, who have not placed their trust in you yet, but they're, they're ready, they're ready. And God, I ask that you would do a good thing, good work in their heart. God, I, I would ask that you would, um, you would hear their prayer and that God, you would forgive their sin and you would help them live in the newness of life that only you could provide. Lord, we thank you uh, for the promises, for your covenant of love, for the commitment and love that you have given us. God, help us to be committed to you and love you in that way as best as we can. <laughs> and we are fallen, but help us to do as best as we can. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, if you're watching this and you have questions or if you're excited and you want to learn about how to take next steps in your relationship with God, hey, give us a call. Call the church, email, text the church, Facebook us, let us know. I want to meet you. I want to help you draw closer to Christ. If you want to join the church, you want to get baptized, you just want to ask some questions, you just want to be prayed for. Hey, that's what we're here for. Uh, and by the way, if you haven't yet, get out your Bible, start reading Jeremiah in just 10 minutes a day. You can be through the book in a month. Yeah, it's a big book, but it's, it's been good and it's exciting. I want to invite you to come back next week. If this message has inspired you, encouraged you, challenged you, invite somebody to come with you next week and share this video with other people. Hey, I'll see you next Sunday. Have a great week.